Welcome to another episode of Grief Talk. Everything you want to know about grief and more. I'm your host, Vaughn Solis. As an author, life transformation coach, online instructor, and bereaved mom since 2005, I'll be bringing you great content that is informative, inspiring, and practical. Whether you have suffered a loss or other adversity, stay tuned and tapped in as I cover a variety of topics to help you get where you want to go on your journey to heal and grow. Today's guest is Betty Wedman. In 2008, Betty's life was changed forever when her teenage son chose to end his life due to bullying and depression. Advocating for mental health since 2008 and as a certified life coach with training in cognitive behavior and QPR for suicide prevention, Betty works to support and empower others in their learning, healing and growth. Betty has contributed to Living Hope, a community plan to prevent suicide in Edmonton, Canada, and became part of the peer working group through the E4C Wellness Network. She facilitates classes and helps others by encouraging teens and adults to become aware of their thoughts and feelings and make positive choices for their life. Okay, so welcome to the show, Betty. I am so grateful for you coming on this Grief Talk podcast and sharing any information and wisdom that you can with our audience uh, because as you and I have talked in the past, it's it's a little bit rare that, that us bereaved folks, and specifically bereaved parents, talk so publicly in the open. So really welcome to the show, Betty. Well, thank you for having me, Vaughn, and I'm also very happy and grateful to be here. Great. So just uh, to let the audience know up front what what uh, Betty is going to mostly be sharing uh, today is uh, her uh, wealth of experience um, in the last 14 plus years uh, since becoming a bereaved mom uh, about, um, you know, strategies for healing, what Betty and I have in common, not only did we lose uh, our children, a teen and a young adult to suicide some years ago, um, but we've never let it be okay to just sit in our laurels and not uh, try and, and recover and get better to the best of our ability. And I think Betty, you and I do have that in common. And I'm not saying that other people, uh, and I'm not saying that other other parents don't, or any bereaved person doesn't. Uh, but as I said, to go public with your vulnerabilities um, is another uh, thing entirely. And so, um, as I said, and I will reiterate throughout this episode, I am grateful, grateful uh, to you, Betty, and any other bereaved person who comes on my show uh, to share what wisdom they've gained. Because um, one, we learn through stories. Two, we learn through information that we open ourselves up to embracing, not necessarily, um, you know, um, initiating it in our life. But once you know something, you can't turn that information off, and then you get to decide what you want to do with it. So on that note, uh, some of the things uh, that we're covering today, and, uh, and I'm going to be learning from Betty too, as we go along and, and, and talk about this stuff, is uh, definitely how thoughts impact our well-being. We're going to be talking about the importance of positive emotions and self-love, and we are going to be talking about resources and uh, support, and um, hopefully we're going to be able to give the audience uh, some more tips on how to feel more supported in their adversity, in their grief, whatever you're going through that makes you feel different. So on that note, uh, Betty, uh, I'd love to ask you to just um, basically explain a little bit about your um, background, what brought you to the work you do, and then as we go along, we'll expand a little bit more uh, about the work that you do. Okay, thanks, Vaughn. Um, well, my background, as Vaughn mentioned, is I, I became a health and wellness life coach, and it was after experiencing the loss of my child. Um it was basically uh, part of it was due to bullying and depression. And I learned so much through this, his friends and my other uh, kids' friends about what, what they think and feel when they experience things like this and why our thoughts and feelings are so important that we take care of ourselves so that we can feel good about ourselves. Mm hmm. Yeah. So diving into that, first of all, I just want to say, um, 
I, I hope we touch on this and probably will a little bit in this episode, Betty. The very fact that, um, you know, teens, uh, mostly it was teens that came to you. Is that right to explain what they were going through? Like your son's friends? Yes. It started off with friends of, of our children. Yeah, And then I started doing some um, presentations in schools on bullying. And I learned so even so much more from all of them. Yeah. And so what we had hoped to do today uh, for the audience is uh, give you a glimpse into uh, what uh, Betty uh, garnered from all that information or some of that information, at least to sort of understand. I think my goal here on the episode, and Betty, you and I have talked about this, it's really to bring awareness um, to parents. And um, well, this episode is not excluded, just, uh, you know, exclusive just for parents, there could be educators, there could be health professionals, there could be concerned aunts, uncles, other family members, friends. And so it's whatever, um, whatever you uh, relationship you may have to someone you may be concerned about, or even for yourself, if you're feeling a certain way, um, it, the invitation is just there to open yourself up to what you're hearing, what you're um, able to absorb, uh, what we missed. And I never speak for another person. I missed a whole bunch. And so the show is not about what, what any one of us has missed in looking back who's already lost our child. But I'm telling you, I wished I had this kind of information. And I wish that that's, you know, 17 years ago, I uh, felt stronger and, and more courageous to, you know, ask my child, my daughter specifically, what she was going through, because young people are going through stuff, right, Betty? And on that note, I'll invite you to um, dive in and, and, and share what you can share with us today about what you've learned. Okay, thanks, Vaughn. Uh, but one of the things first that I learned was so much about what the students were thinking while they were going through their, their challenging times. And this is just basically talking right now in the school environment. So when they were being bullied, um, they wanted to escape the life at school. They wanted to skip school, or they wanted to keep trying not to interact with those people. Right. Um, they told me they heard the voices of those making fun of them over and over again. Um, they said they had no idea what to do or how to handle it. Uh, they started to believe everything that they were called to be true. Um, uh, wow. they said they failed themselves. Mm -hmm. They failed at life. Wow. Um, you know, they asked questions like about what are they going to do to me today? Are they what are they going to say? Are they going to corner me? And for me, when I even heard that statement, it broke my heart because we send our kids to school thinking they are going to be safe and mm -hmm. they shouldn't have to fear or plan their way around the school. Because one one girl shared that she strate strategically had to plan her way around the school in the places that these people were least likely to be. So wow. when we talk about thoughts and feelings, what, I, what I've learned is because I've had my own challenges too with experiencing all this, is a thought is just something that we keep thinking. So we really have to become aware of what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, a thought can be changed and it starts with self-awareness. Right. Uh, I call it like garbage in, garbage out, or it can be like our computers when they don't cooperate with us. We have to do a control alt delete and reboot them. And we have to do that to our minds as well. Mm -hmm. I totally when we change agree. our thoughts. We, we can change our mood mm -hmm. or we can, I always said, I, when I grew up, I worked in a theater and at that time we had reel to reel. <laughs> and sometimes that reel in the middle of a movie would break. And sometimes we need to do that with our own thoughts. We have to break them and replace them with something, you know, maybe more positive. That's a really great visual. I'm just thinking now, I had no idea you were in the theater, so that's pretty cool. I love the idea of the reel to reel because even as, as you're saying it, and, and as adults, I just really want to stress here, this isn't about that this is just a particular 
to children and teens that they're struggling with these things. In fact, it's the things, in my opinion, that don't get resolved in our younger years that make us have an awful lot of problems as adults. And it takes a lot of self-work and, and commitment and dedication to wanting to be a better you you know, for me to be a better me, for you to be a better you, anybody out there, you know, watching or listening to this and just, you know, and always keep at the lessons and the learning because everything you've just described, Betty, it almost, it does break my heart. I was going to say it almost brings me to tears, but I said, I'm not crying. Um, it, it, it's incredibly painful um, as a mother who lost her child to think that, some of these things, if not all of these things you talked about, were occurring in her life. And I didn't have a clue, not a clue. And so I know we might circle back to this a little bit, but the fact that the, the, fact that the young people shared with you, they trusted you, and obviously your compassion and empathy made them feel safe, that you were going to be a vessel to listen. Um, so what can, and again, I'm not sure that you came upon any positive action in the years that you were speaking at schools, um, or even your knowledge of them in the education system. This is not dumping on schools. This is all about awareness and, um, and, uh, you know, sort of incorporating strategies, policies, changes, uh, to help these kids to your knowledge, um, are schools doing that or in the case of the schools that you spoke at did they hear what like did you were you able to sort of uh, relay what the kids were were feeling and going through I mean to have to strategize your way through you know getting around the halls and into classrooms and bathrooms that would take a lot of stress that's a lot of anxiousness inducing so do you know if schools are kind of incorporating strategies to deal with these mental health issues well, you know, Vaughn, it was, it's been quite a while since I've been in a school because of COVID. COVID changed a lot. Yeah. But I think it's, it varies from school to school and it varies on um, the, the leadership in the schools as well. Okay. And we, we have to face it that a lot of us are uncomfortable with talking about these things because we, we don't know how to handle them all. And yeah. I think that my biggest thing is we have to start somewhere, even though we don't have all the answers or the best solutions, but we do start to talk about it. Right. So I'm just thinking here for kids, does a buddy system work like with your experience over the years? Um, and even in, in the support work you do now, the people that come and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, the support group uh, that you're part of. Uh, but when people come in uh, younger or older, what kind of a system would make them feel safe? And, as, and because we're sort of focusing on teens today, does a buddy system work? Is it all about the trust that they need to have at least one person that they can trust to even tell how, what they're feeling, how they're feeling, but then believe that something's going to be done to change it? You hit that right on. I, I, I certainly believe they need to find one person that they can trust and tell. And, you know, whether that can't be somebody within the school system, it has to be a family member, or, you know, if they have somebody in their church that they can trust, um, you know, they do need to find somebody that they can connect with. Mm -hmm. And most important is, like you said, we have to listen, and we have to believe that they truly are experiencing this. Good point. Good point. So does that um, suggest, not you, but just that that statement suggests that that the teens, the, our youth, don't, don't trust and believe that other people believe what they're going through? Um, I have heard that, yes. That, that, that is, you know, a few comments that I have heard. Or, oh, mm -hmm. it's not that serious. You know, let it go. To them, to, to each person, what may be serious to some may not be to somebody else. And it's, it's really important to listen and to validate their feelings and what they're going through. 
Yeah. Um, I just want to quickly uh, say here, I, I did another episode with an educator uh, who works specifically with uh, teaching social skills, but really what and 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 you know and how to get it into their school system in the Los Angeles area. And um, so what you're saying is just so interesting because my guests work with younger children, but they're acknowledged and is aware there's a very large problem with the teens in schools. And as reiterating what you're saying, it basically is leadership at the school. It's not a sort of school, um, you know, it's not a, a, a state or federal or in our case, provincial uh, policy that you have to do this. And, um, she was a special educator and I just want, and, and so what I'm saying here is even from the education side of things, she's reiterating, she reiterated exactly what you're saying. So the kids coming to you in confidence and speaking from that emotional side and her as an educator and, and witnessing and then going into a, a structured, creating a structured program to teach kids interdependence and confidence in the way to sort of stand up to bullying and, and things like that. I'm telling you, you're just confirming everything that she said and, and vice versa. So I want the audience to understand that they're, and I think actually people know, I don't, I don't think we have to convince anybody that there are issues of um, isolation and all the things you just talked about, Betty, and we need to find a better way to develop communication, community and trust and safety so that, and you know, so that when any one of us uh, who feels like we're in some kind of minority group, um, even a, even for us as bereaved parents, when you don't feel you've got that support there and that community there that's talkative and, you know, and um, you can express freely what you're going through and you can be different and you can be vulnerable and you can still be in the workforce and you can still do studies and you can still participate in what I like to call the mainstream um, it's so important we talk about these things so everybody understands, one, they are just at risk as a parent. You're just at risk, as, as Betty and I um, ultimately found out, to go through what we've gone through. But more generally, just to know that, you know, our kids are not always okay at any age. We spoke briefly before, Betty, right? And I said to you, we'll always, we always worry about our kids. Um, this, yeah, this brings me to um, your work that you do in um, positive emotions. And what would you be able to share with the audience, either for someone that is listening to this that needs it for themselves, their child, again, another loved one, friend, whatever. What pr approach do you take to instill positive emotions? Well, I call it we have to know ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. We have to know what brings us joy. Yes. And because when we get stuck in something that's very unpleasant, which we all experience, I mean, even of us as adults, we we have life experiences that aren't always pleasant. And you look for people that bring that to you, whether it be family, whether it be friends, um, laughter, watch a comedy, do anything to distract yourself. To, you know, I mean, it's temporary, but it, it does bring relief. Uh, you know, journal or do do some um, personal writing, um, silence. I call that even like my meditation and just sitting in quiet and letting things just be, um, you know, find things that you're appreciative for or grateful for. So that could be like helping others or serving others. Uh, it could be something as volunteering because we know that volunteering is very rewarding. And just find things to be grateful for every day. They say that even if we write down three to five, three, five things that we're grateful for, that that, that can really change our life. And it can be something because somebody held the door open for me or they gave me a smile because nobody knows what your day is truly grow going, right? No, kindness is really important. Um, I know that I know that for uh, those of us in bereavement and difficult bereavement it takes a while to get to the uh, gratitude thing and um, I do a little bit of work in that so that's another topic but for the again going back to the younger folks our teens our youth who are really confused and basically most of them I mean okay it, there might be uh, the odd one that is like feels on track but um, 
for those that are still trying to figure out just life, just trying to figure out, you know, junior high, see, you know, senior high and college, university, all that. So some of these tools, what, what do you, um, if when you're working with teens or in the support group, you know, you see your teens or youth come in, what sort of strategies, if they're really not ready for um, some of the things that you just mentioned uh, for uh, us to, to do to, um, you know, instill positive emotions within us, are there any, I guess the question is, are there any other strategies directed at younger people who may not really have a grasp on gratitude. Maybe they do, but maybe they don't, you know, and they're just trying to get life focused. And, 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 you know, you, you nailed it when you said that when the problem is before us, it's a mountain, it's huge. And, and to be bullied or to have anything else really impacting their life really negatively, that will more than likely overcome everything else. I don't want to be grateful. I just want to survive the day. So do you have any strategies or tips that you know of that you have, have used yourself in your coaching, um, you know, any in your assistance and support that would be directed at the young folks? Um, th- yes, because I think even for myself, Vaughn, uh, when I went through all this with losing my son, I, I had a lot of anger. <laughs> yeah. And we, we don't like to talk about that. No. But the thing is that you have to address the anger and know what makes you angry and not be afraid of it, because I, I have found that we're afraid to even talk about our emotions. And if I think if we talk about it, and we give name to it, it, it lessens. Um, sometimes even just sharing with other people, even though nothing can, they can't help you. Mm-hmm. Just knowing that you released it is, is a step in the right direction. Oh, that's so important. So Um, question. So it's coming to me as I'm thinking about this. So someone who may be down on their luck, uh, feeling, you know, lack of confidence, I'm talking about a younger person here. Um, You know, all, again, all those things that, you know, isolation, you know, feeling different, the more you hear you're a failure, I am a failure, I'll never be able to do anything. So what you just said is, for me, I think is a key point, being able to just express it, the anger, pain, in my opinion. um, Now, let me rephrase that. Anger is pain. I think every negative emotion is rooted in pain of some sort. And um, so, but let's not deny the power of anger. And you know what? I agree with you. Um, We don't want to admit when we're angry. I'm not going to say we're angry people, but we're experiencing anger. And when I first, when I first lost my daughter, I went to see someone to, you know, help me. And um, that person said to me, you're very angry no, I'm not. No, I'm not. But you know, the truth is I was and I carried around a lot of anger. But very fortunately for me, I have the kind of personality that can be explosive, not violent, nothing like that, just get it out. And then you do feel better. You do feel better. But I think when we stuff our emotions and stuff the anger, and we're just supposed to, I don't know, what are we supposed to do with it, Betty? Just leave it inside us? No, absolutely not. Um, And that is one of the things that I've learned through even my journey is we need to release it. It's like, name it, claim it, and let it go. And I know for myself, a lot of times people say, let it go. And I would sometimes get angry even at that statement, because it was like, I'm trying to let it go, but it's not leaving me. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, it is just making friends with it and not being because most people are afraid when people get angry, we're afraid of that anger. I'm just, it's coming to me, making friends with our emotions. But I did want to just say to you, and for some of the younger people who maybe can't introspectively center themselves, um, you know, I'm thinking if sports or some kind of physical um, activity that lets them punch it out, you know, like anything that that is a, a constructive um, you know, sort of after school or a uh, hobby or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, the karate and all that. Anyway, I was just, I was just thinking about how maybe if we can't internally process stuff, which takes years to, to master, if you even ever get that point to that, to that point, if you think that some kind of physical exertion can be a substitute, say for, I don't like that word, but you know, if they don't want to talk to somebody, You know what I mean? If they can't internalize the positive emotions, I'm just asking, would, would, um, 
you know, some kind of activity uh, that they can exert it? Would would that help? Uh, I believe it would. I, I yeah. think it all depends on the person. But I mean, you you said it very clearly, like uh, there's things that you can go and kick a soccer ball. You could do a punching bag. Yeah. You can scream into a pillow to let out, let out that negative energy. Um, yeah. I know yes. that at one point I was driving home and I screamed in my car, but I have yep. to say it felt good. But then somebody said to me, did you roll down your window to let that energy out? Yeah, I, I had an experience like that too. Um, I, I'm not a super physical person and um, I'm just going to be honest in later years here now I've taken to buying furry pillows and um, because I no longer have animals but that's another thing in that I'm just going to suggest maybe people think about and even even our young people you know is uh, animals if you have a pet you know man they can be a source of comfort and if you don't have a pet furry pillow works. I'm uh, just saying, did I just buy a furry pillow? Yes, I did. And pets give such unconditional love. Yes, yes. Now that's not to gain, we're not talking about having these as substitutes, but we're talking, you know, to actually making changes in school systems, ma making changes in society. The more we're talking about um, mental health, uh, that we, you know, and, and in a positive way. And if my opinion about this is that, to just even feel free enough to say, ah, oh, yeah, I've got this disorder or yeah, I, I'm struggling with some limitations, but you know, I'm showing up. Great. Good on you. Instead of, yeah, next, you know, let's, let's see the one that doesn't have any problems. And so I think I have to believe, and I'm thinking that certainly in our North American culture, we're be becoming a little bit more open to understanding our vulnerabilities and, perhaps not embracing them, but at least being aware of them and making some accommodation for them. Would you, do you feel that way? Or do you think something different? Um, no, I, I think we need to break the stigma because I, I know that a lot of us are afraid to speak out about what's going on in our lives. Um, I don't think there is, I'm just going to speak from my personal experience and with what I've learned so far. I don't think there is a person on this planet that is not experiencing something. And it may not be now, it might be later in their life, but if we can talk about it and start getting the tools that we need so that when we do get into tough situations, we're better equipped. I 100% agree with you. And um, sometimes as the one going through something, I'm just gonna throw in, we have to be the one to educate Sometimes our medical practitioners, our employers, um, our family members, our friends, I've had to do a lot of educating and um, not making myself feel wrong for that, which I did for years, again, personal experience. But when you're vulnerable audience, you tend to, in my opinion and experience, and Betty, I'll ask you if you feel this as well, you tend to make yourself the problem and take the weight of needing to be better for others instead of, wait a second here, you guys, I need you to embrace this, support it, just like we would support any other physical affliction that we understand all too well. Illness, diabetes, you know, you name any um any disease or affliction out there that we could all relate to as possibly getting, there is a lot of support for it when it becomes um, mental and emotional, uh, it's not quite the same thing, right? We struggle a little bit with, um, because because it's for so long, decades, it's been the other person has this affliction. You know, it, there's such a stigma, as you said, to mental, we don't really talk about emotional health, and I think we need to, but there's such a stigma to mental health. And um, so I want to move into... Um, basically self-love, Betty. This was a key part of what, what you wanted to, to speak about and I wanted to speak about today. So we're working with the acknowledgement of the struggle. We're working with the positive emotions and doing what we can uh, to center ourselves in positive emotions. Um, now, uh, and, and, and having supports, having better support systems and understand we're all vulnerable in some way, shape or form 
you know, let, let's be a team about this all together, my words. Anyway, now the self-love. And this is challenging, hugely challenging for, I'm going to say, pretty much everybody on the planet. So what are your thoughts on self-love? How do, how do we learn to love ourselves, Betty? Step by step, <laughs> one step at a time, because yeah. we, we are all experiencing things in our life. And um, I mm-hmm. think it's just knowing that no matter what's happening in our life and how difficult things can be, that we're still worthy, that we're still worthy people. Yeah. And that we, you know, we're des- <clears throat> we're worthy of love. We're deserving of love. We can give and receive love. And that when uh, tough circumstances happen, that doesn't really define who we are. It's just an experience that we're having. And uh, we need to work our way through it. I and that's when we need to re- reach out to other people. Like we need to have a support system. We need to be able to um, share with others. And even if others can't help, just the idea of releasing it and having someone listen to us. Yeah, I think that... Um... Ultimately, my view is that, um, and I'm, I'd like to know your thoughts on this, is that we're responsible for our own healing and our own and our own well-being. But it's not a journey that we should be expected nor want to take alone. Um, would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I would. And we are responsible for ourselves because, I mean, I think in life, Quite often we try to change other people, but we can't. Change only begins with us. Yeah, and it's coming to me too. I wanted to just um, jump back into a really quick moment here. Again, bringing it back to our young people, our kids. And I even feel this again, that it's not just exclusive to the, uh, you know, the youth and, and teen years you know, when they're forming themselves, when they're finishing school, when they're choosing careers, uh, programs at university or college, uh, whatever labor force they might want to work in if they're not, you know, going into higher education. Um, it, it's coming to me, and I've had this dis- discussion before, where we want our kids so, so badly, we, you know, to be successful, that it's so easy to overlook the potential vulnerabilities or real vulnerabilities they're living with. The world is a super challenging place. Um, I believe it's it's the aim and goal should be to make the family the soft the soft place to fall and um, be walking that door and you know you get to take off your your mainstream mask. You just get to be who you are. You get to sit down, have that cup of tea or whatever and just talk with with your parents and wow, this is what, this is like what happened today. And can't, like like you said earlier, can't do anything about it, maybe right at this moment. But at least we're aware, you can't change anything unless you're aware, right? Um, Absolutely. I'm going to ask you this just, and and this is not, uh, this is just personal, personal viewpoint, um, to try and um, help if there's any educators watching this or people involved in school settings and so on. do you think that um, that it is possible to incorporate, I'm not saying what type of strategies, but strategies or policies in school systems to better support mental health uh, in, uh, you know, for the students? Because we can, you know, sit here and talk about the problems, but it's still, they still have to be addressed and, and a space has to be created for real work to be done uh, to change this, to make kids feel safe and and to make, you know, uh, to help them not make, well, make them feel safe and help them want to, you know, seek support. Um, I'll just say one thing here that uh, episode I, I talked about earlier on social skills. One of the reasons my guest said that the kids will stop reaching uh, out for support um, is that they may have had a really bad experience when they did share what they were feeling within the system i think it's actually vital because that's where our kids spend the majority of their day and i i really feel that um, they need more health and wellness um, courses embedded into the curriculum are you specifically talking like mental emotional health and and uh, well-being we were going to talk a little bit about the body systems this is a really great place to sort of bring that up you want to just explain what body systems are? Well, one of the things too, uh, Sean, is that when my son was going through his 
bullying in school. He was injured and we had to take him to the hospital. And at that time, all they did was an ultrasound and they dealt with the physical aspect of his injury. But nobody asked him, and this was in hindsight because somebody asked me that, did they ask him anything about emotionally what it did to him when he experienced this, what it did to him mentally? Mm -hmm. And I had to reflect upon that, but I I've learned too, because I've had to take courses on healing myself or everything I've been through that we are more than just our physical body. We have our emotional body, which is our feelings. And we talked a little bit earlier, like we can journal, we can meditate, we can uh, let go of the past, we can forgive and that we all have a range of feelings. You know, we go from anger to joy, to happiness, to depression, and I think everybody experienced that at, at some point in their life. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a mental body, which is our thoughts. And we talked about that at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we can think about it, if we are just even standing somewhere in our favorite place, whether at the beach or in our backyard, and if we look, I call it looking up to the sky and just all those little bubble clouds going by. And the kids shared with me that, you know, they were called stupid, loser, I, you know, fag, gay, bitch, slut, all those words. Mm -hmm. But we can also look up and look at the, all the other bubbles that are out there. You know, you're worthy, you're lovable, you're, you know, you've got this, you can do it. And it's replacing those negative thoughts with positive thoughts. And I, we need to teach that. We really do. I think that um, it's not something you learn through the education system. Um, I know that you, you do learn it when you go through counseling and things like that. But I think if we were more open about these things, it would be uh, definitely more beneficial to the kids. Um, we also want to, you know, examine our our beliefs and attitudes, because sometimes people tell us things and, and we believe it to be true. You know, I know that I've had students tell me that they've been called stupid. And when you get called stupid over and over and over, you start to believe that that's what you are. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not, it's, it's, we all learn differently. And it doesn't mean just because we learn differently, we're stupid. And then we yeah. have a, a spiritual body, which is our connection to our higher self. And our higher self, I, I say there's a small self and a higher self. And the small self is the one that says, we can't do this. You know, no, there's, <laughs> you're not capable of that. And then there's the higher self that's going to encourage you to say, yes, you can, you can get beyond this. You, you've you got this. And we have to decide who we're going to listen to. Um, you know, we can, we can make vision boards to where we want to be. We can pray. Um, you know, we can meditate. Um, and there's yeah. even take it, take it one step further. We talked about that in the beginning. There's the social and that's our connection to others. And now with COVID for the last few years, a lot of us lost that and the impact that it had on our, our, our own mental health and well-being. Which just really, really shows how important connection and community is and that not one person is better. Anybody watching or listening to this, not one person is better or greater than you. Not one. And Betty, when you talk about high self, yes, so we, we're from source, we are from substance that is so much greater than our human makeup, our physical makeup, that um, the earlier we can learn to sort of tap into that energy as power, personal power, the sooner you start to understand that you can create what you want and you no longer have to experience what you're experiencing in the same way. But that's another episode. I just want to throw it out there. And if you're younger and watching this, trust trust in that and believe in that because there's a lot of um, a younger generation of people up and coming, and I'm hoping to have a few of them on this show that are teaching the language of today. I know holding the space is something they talk about. And um, so it, it people, it is being, the, the baton is getting passed from older generations to younger generations to learn these lessons, to get in touch with your heart, with your power, with your higher self, 
understanding your true, true abilities and where what you're coming from. And um, if you if you can delve into that, anybody watching this that hasn't done that yet, I invite you to do it because it really changes your life. Uh, right, Betty? Yeah. Yes. And Vaughn, I can even just add to that is following your your intuition. Yes. So many times we know things or we we say, oh, I had a feeling for this, but to really trust that. True. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and I'll just say here again for the audience that trust is so much about trusting yourself first. And um, I'll I'll bet you, Betty, you um you might agree with me on this when you're a really strong person anyway, and then something happens to you really bad, uh, like in my case, losing my child, absolutely st stole all my power. And I had, I had been dedicated to a path of personal power and manifestation and metaphysics and all of that stuff, living the life. And so I really do understand both sides of the coin when it's you feel powerless because of something happening to you, to us. Um, but there are ways back and out of it. It's not simple, but there are ways back and out of it. And anything you can tap into to help you, uh, you know, just kickstart it. Because one thing always leads to another. Would you agree? W would, you ag would you agree with that, Betty? Yes, I do. Right. It's just being strong enough and courageous enough to take that first step. So turning to uh, support, um, we both wish there was better support for um, certainly, I'm just going to speak to suicide support here, but for child loss um, in general. Uh, and um, But I would say to a, to a greater extent, maybe mental health. And I know that in Canada, yay, we're getting the 988 number. I think in 2023, that will be the 988 suicide hotline number, which is way better than, you know, dialing 10 digits. But be because we're just keeping things at more general level in, in our episode today, uh, Betty, I was just going to, uh, I wanted to ask you two last things and they're, they're related. So the one would be you obviously work and have worked, uh, volunteered or uh, worked otherwise in support. And you have a fabulous support organization in Edmonton, Canada, uh, Living Hope. And uh, you've, you've been involved with that for a number of years, uh, from what I understand. And so one, you have a, a front row access to people who are coming in and asking for, for help. But you also understand the flip side of that and what might be preventing somebody uh, age appropriate from uh, seeking support services. So do you want to speak a little bit uh, to that before we close out here? In my case, it might be you feel misunderstood. Uh, I don't know. What are some of the reasons that people would not reach out for support, Betty? Uh, I think for myself, um, the, the, exactly what you said, the fear of mis being, being misunderstood, being judged, uh, mm -hmm. feeling like nobody will help them because, you know, they might have reached out to somebody before, but that person couldn't help. But I want to encourage people to reach out to as many people as possible, because sometimes even um, each and every one of us, we don't have experience in everything. And we're not really equipped to help everybody with every problem. And so reach out to as many people as you can. Don't don't give up. That's that's my biggest advice is do not give up and just keep going at it. Um, I would also encourage people to go to their public library, read a book if if they have something um, to, uh, you know, if, if they're looking for something on anger, go read a book on anger, initiate it yourself and Plus, reach out to a professional. I mean, uh, there's a lot of wonderful psychologists that can help you move through your pain and suffering. Right. Um, it's important that we share because when we share, we learn and grow. I know that when I was in these school systems, um, even when I asked questions, a lot of the students would not participate. But when they gave me feedback, they would say, I didn't participate because I was scared, but boy, did I learn a lot. And to me, that's just opening yeah. the doors. They may not be ready now to yeah. reach out for help, but with time, 
and knowing that they see other people talking about it moving forward, we can change it. Oh, that's so powerful to know, Betty. That is so powerful. Yeah. Um, I just want to say I was also thinking about the books. And in my early bereavement, I did books, library, support group, talk to people. And eventually it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And I was terrified too, to speak about my experience because of stigma. Um, you know, there's a stigma with suicide, there's a bit of a stigma with child loss, and people don't understand you. And certainly with time and experience, um, you know, not everything is like it, it evolves, we evolve, and we learn how to handle things uh, differently. But it that's really a great suggestion to check library resources, online books, uh, there's lots and lots of people online offering different types of support and so on and so forth. Um, a an in person support group can be extremely powerful for the community, and really in your face understanding you're not you're not alone in what you're going through. You're not alone, but we need more of them. I mean, you're very lucky. There's where you're living. It sounds like there's some decent support. I'm not going to say maybe great, but decent support. But in a lot of towns and smaller communities, and maybe even just a community. Um, you have to drive quite a distance. Even where I currently live, I if I wanted to continue to attend a support group for bereaved parents, which is the Compassionate Friends, it's like a 45-minute drive to get there. And um, so, you know, I no longer attend support groups, um, but I'm very dedicated to wanting to establish my own community where people can feel supported with my any, any of the resources that I can provide and knowledge uh, and, and all, you know, on my own website and, and through this podcast with sharing with people uh, like you, Betty, and, and other guests. So um, on that note, and, and as we come to a close, uh, I know that uh, you were going to uh, or are going to provide a uh, list of resources, uh, which I'll be putting a link to those resources in the description below uh, for the audience. Uh, did you want to just briefly mention what these resources uh, are? Absolutely. Um, if you're experiencing bullying, there's Bully Free Alberta. Okay. There's the Kids Help Phone. There's the Family Violence Information Line. And also there's the Addiction and Mental Health, which is a 24-7 line that, that most people can reach out to. Okay. Okay. And again, I encourage you, please don't be afraid to reach out for help. Know that you're not alone. Um, take care of yourself because everything does start with the self. Um, balance your four body systems. Re just remember that we are more than just our physical body. We need to take care of our emotions and our mental health and our spiritual health. Exactly. Uh, to be aware of your thoughts and your feelings because that impacts our, our life immensely. Uh, to believe in yourself and to speak up for yourself. I, I know that um, I learned a lot that the students were afraid to speak up. Mm -hmm. And I think we're the only ones that can speak up for ourselves and to I, remind yourself that um, taking care of your mental health is investing in your future. And we all want to li live a happy, productive life. Not only do we want to, um, we deserve it. So, so you know, we really do deserve it. And I can't say this for a fact, but I like to think that if you stand up to a bully, it would shock them. And hopefully, whoa, I don't know if it changes it. And I'm not an expert, but I am saying Betty has listed some resources. Certainly some of those might be local to uh, to her area. I'll identify those in, in the resources. Um, but it's enough to know if there's that type of support in one location, look for a similar support in the location that you're living um, I'll also put uh, some links to suicide support for both uh, the uh, states and, and Canada. And again, if you're watching or listening from another country, look into these uh, support systems where you are. Just Google it and see what they have for support. Check it out. If it doesn't help, you know, they may have and should have other resources that, that will help you with, with these issues. Again, today, Betty, was just to give people a more high-level maybe a little bit more than a high level, but some insight into what kids are struggling with uh, in their own words, uh, having spoken to you and, you know, some of the strategies to uh, basically help themselves, uh, you know, through various um, ways uh, to 
as you just said, I'm reiterating everything you said, to get that body system back in balance and understand it'll, these are tools that uh, will help anybody through the rest of their life, right? Lives. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Life skills. <laughs> Life skills. Exactly. All right. Well, Betty, thank you so much again for coming on the show and sharing, uh, you know, some of what you do and uh, some of your wisdom. It's wonderful. And sharing some of your story. And um, of course, you and I both uh, share condolences for each other in our loss and to any other bereaved parent out there, anyone uh, having suffered uh, a loss recently or longer ago. Um, you know, obviously we uh, have compassion and empathy and that is the work that we're in. We still want you to learn, heal and grow as much as you can so that uh, your loss will not rob you of the life that you deserve. So thanks again, uh, Betty. It was wonderful chatting. You're most welcome. Take care. Take care.